and sing praise that is rightfully yours. Lord, I ask that now that you just uh, be with Brother Jimmy now as he stands before us and fill him once again with our Holy Spirit and open our ears that we may hear this morning. And this is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you open your Bibles with me this morning to Acts chapter 7? Acts chapter 7. We're going to begin reading with verse 9. Acts chapter 7. We'll begin reading with verse 9. We have been taking a journey through the book of Acts, and we are finding so many wonderful things to capture our attention. Stephen has been arrested for preaching the gospel. The servant leader of the early church was charged with blasphemy. He was charged with blasphemy against Moses and against the temple. When he began his defense, he began his defense with Abraham. The Sanhedrin had not mentioned Abraham. There really was no need for a mention of Abraham. Because the people to whom Stephen has been asked to give an account of why he would preach a gospel regarding a resurrected Jesus, those men knew the story of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. They knew the law of Moses. The Sadducees believed those five books of the Bible. They believed that they were the most important books of the Bible. The Pharisees also believed those five books, but they added the prophets, and they added the words of wisdom found in the Old Testament. So as Stephen is addressing these men, he's not addressing a bunch of country rubes. He's addressing well-educated people. Therefore... He preaches an historical retrospective to these men. Count me among the, hist- the, uh, the rubes. Historical rep- retrospective is a hard sermon to preach. To be able to draw from history and to count into that history the wonder of the truths that are found there. But when you speak that word to people who know that word, they can identify with what you're saying. When Stephen began his sermon in Acts chapter 7, through the first eight verses, he draws from the life of Abraham. Why would he begin with Abraham? Well, for one thing, Abraham is the father of Israel. Abraham is the one to whom all things trace for the Israelites. And he would begin with Abraham for this very reason. Abraham had been called out of a pagan land and pagan cities to go to a promised land where he would dwell with God. That call came not by system of laws that were given to Abraham. That call came not because Abraham had done anything to deserve that call. Abraham had done nothing marvelous in his life. Abraham was called because of grace. God in his grace had called Abraham. And God in his grace, when he called Abraham, gave to Abraham promises, a promised land. So he goes to possess a land, a land that he's only going to be able to own a burial plot. That's all he will buy. That's all he will own in that promised land. But you see, the promise wasn't just to Abraham. The promise was to his descendants. Well, at the time that promise was given to Abraham, which was probably middle-aged, Abraham didn't have any descendants at all. In fact, at one time, he got so desperate that he began discussing the idea of giving everything he possessed to his chief servant. 
So Abraham not only is the recipient of grace, but by faith alone, Abraham follows God and they have a relationship together because Abraham believes God. Even though he's only going to own a little piece of ground, even though he has no descendants at that moment in time, Abraham believes God. Because Abraham believes God, the promised son is born, Isaac, not before Ishmael is born to the bondservant. And even after Sarah dies, Abraham marries again, and he has a number of sons to whom he gives gifts and sends them away while he is alive. Hagar and Ishmael have gone away. The other sons have gone away. He has Isaac, the son of promise, and to him he leaves his inheritance. Here is the one through whom all things will take place. When Abraham dies, he has one son of promise. And the scripture says that when he died, when he breathed his last, he died satisfied with his life. Everything had not been fulfilled. Even the potential of everything was not fully seen. Abraham had only seen the very tip, 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 tip of the iceberg. But he believed God. Let me say to you, the happiest way to pass from this life is to know that you have received the grace of God and you have believed him. And you've had a relationship with him because of that. By the way, God said to Abraham that these descendants that he had would not only be numbered with the stars of the sky and the sand of the sea, but he also understood that they were going to be enslaved for a period of time. And that's kind of where we are now, getting ready for that enslavement. In Acts chapter 7, beginning with verse 9, here's Stephen as he continues this sermon to the Sanhedrin court, this apology, this defense of his faith and his preaching. In verse 9 of chapter 7, the patriarchs became jealous of Joseph and sold him into Egypt. Jacob had had 12 sons. These are the ones we call the patriarchs. They became jealous of their brother Joseph, sold him into Egypt, yet God was with him and rescued him from all his afflictions and granted him favor and wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he made him governor over Egypt and all his household. Now the famine came over all Egypt and Canaan and great affliction with it and our fathers could find no food. But when Jacob heard there was grain in Egypt, he sent our fathers there the first time. On the second visit, Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And Joseph's family was disclosed to Pharaoh. Then Joseph sent word, or yes, Joseph sent word and invited Jacob, his father, and all his relatives to come to him, 75 persons in all. And Jacob went down to Egypt, and there he and our fathers died. From there, they were removed to Shechem. And laid in a tomb which Abraham had purchased for a sum of money from the sons of Hamron in Shechem. Why would Stephen choose to include this story of Joseph? One reason he would choose to include it is because, remember, he was accused of blaspheming the temple. Joseph was well respected by the Jews. And Jewish literature proves he was well respected. But Joseph was also well respected by the Samaritans. Think about this. Jews and the Samaritans didn't like one another. That difficulty had begun following the captivity. 
probably before the captivity when they were two separate nations. There was a great deal of dislike and distrust. Do you remember the time in John chapter 4 when Jesus is traveling on the edge of Samaria? They've actually entered into a little bit of Samaria. His disciples are hungry. They go into town to buy food. Jesus stays beside a well, Jacob's well, in Samaria. And a woman comes from the city. And in the encounter with the woman, Jesus tells her about a water of life that she may know. And the woman, as she's in a religious discussion with Jesus, says to him, Our fathers say we worship God in this mountain. And your fathers say in Jerusalem. I can assure you the wheels are turning in the mind of these Jewish men as they're hearing Stephen talk about Joseph. Why? Because Joseph is a type is a picture, reveals to us much about who Jesus Christ is. Our text today begins with jealousy. Here again, this word, the patriarchs became jealous of Joseph and sold him into Egypt. They became jealous. Jealousy, envy. It happened from the start in Abraham's story. When Hagar becomes the the servant of Sarah, becomes pregnant with Ishmael, she begins to feel a little uppity about that. And the scripture says she despised Sarah. So much so that she and Sarah did not get along, and finally Hagar fled from Sarah because of fear. But an angel of the Lord comes to her, sends her back to Sarah to be Sarah's servant. Ishmael continues in life. Isaac is born to Sarah. And when Isaac reaches the age of becoming a man accepted into his position, Ishmael is making fun of Isaac. And Sarah sees that. And she goes to Abraham and she says, I want you to send this woman and her son away from us. So Abraham does what he can to provide for them and sends them away. Thinking that they're about to die, Hagar sets her son in a place and she moves to a different place so that she cannot see her son and hear her son. And the angel of the Lord comes and says, there's water right here. Continue on your journey because God will make from this child a great nation. You see, Abraham already knew that God was at work keeping his promises. From Abraham would come many nations. Jealousy continued. Isaac has two sons, Esau and Jacob, twins. And there's jealousy between them. Esau is is Isaac's favorite. Jacob is the favorite of his mother, Rebekah. One day Esau comes in from hunting and he says to his brother, I'm starving to death. I've been out here all this time hunting and I'm hungry. I'm tired. I I, I want some of the bean soup that you're making. And Jacob says to his brother, I'll sell you a bowl of porridge for your birthright. Esau says, what's that to me? Kind of gives you insight into these two guys. The transaction is completed in the eating of the porridge. But then there comes a day when Isaac is about to die. Somewhat blind. His life about to end. Ready to give his sons a blessing. He says to his oldest son, I want you to go out. I want you to go hunting. I want you to make my favorite meal. I want you to bring it to me. Rebecca hears that. She knows that the blessing is about to be given. So she says to to Jacob, 
I'm going to make the, the father's favorite meal and I'm going to make for you covering. And she puts a covering on his hands and on his arms so that Isaac can feel the hair of that covering because Esau was a hairy man. He smells like the outdoors. He takes the food his mother's prepared. He goes in and he literally steals the blessing of his brother Esau in that moment because Rebecca has taught him how to twist things. Jacob leaves, goes to his mother's country, marries there, Leah, Rachel. He didn't want the girls in that order, but that's the order he got them because of his father-in-law. They eventually return. He meets Esau and they separate for one last time. Basically because there's still the feelings of fear and jealousy. Jacob has 12 sons from Leah and from Rachel. Among those sons is one named Joseph. Joseph, although born late in life, was the eldest of Rachel's sons, and he received Jacob's greatest blessings. The jealousy of Jacob's brothers is expressed in their jealousy of his dreams of future authority and a special gift that his father had given him. Jacob favored Joseph because Joseph was born to the wife that Jacob loved. And in his favoritism, the scripture says that he made for Joseph a very colored tunic or a multicolored coat. Genesis chapter 37 verse 3 says, Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his sons because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a very colored tunic. Only Joseph got such a beautiful coat. The very next verse tells us how his brothers felt about it. His brothers saw that their father loved Joseph more than all his brothers, and so they hated him and could not speak to him on friendly terms. And then Joseph had the audacity to tell them what he had dreamed. He tells his brothers about this dream where we were out in the field and we were collecting and making sheaves. And he said, when we were doing this, my sheaves stood straight up. My sheaves stood erect. And your sheaves all gathered around my sheave. And all your sheaves bowed down to my sheave. Not really smart, Joseph. He spoke of the authority that he was going to have. And another dream that he had, he dreamed that the sun and the moon and the stars, 11 of them, bowed down to him. The sun being his father, the moon being his mother, the 11 stars being his brothers, they would all bow down to him. And what was the result of that? Well, the result of that is found in Genesis chapter 37, verses 5 through 11, where it says, they hated him more than ever. <laughs> Their hatred continued to grow. So what was the result of jealousy? It was rejection. The brothers of Joseph, the patriarchs of Israel, rejected God's chosen servant, Joseph. As the brothers of Joseph opposed him, so their descendants now oppose the Messiah that God had sent to save the people. Just as the 11 brothers opposed Joseph, so Israel had opposed Jesus Christ, Jesus the Messiah. What is the result? They and when we look at this, we understand that the brothers rejected Joseph because they blinded themselves to God's purpose and plan in Joseph's life. Their jealousy led to an envy that wanted not only the things that Joseph had, but begrudged the fact that Joseph had what he had. They not only wanted to take those things from Joseph, but they wanted to make him suffer through the loss that was inflicted upon him. Driven by their jealousy of Joseph's honor, his, rec their, his recognition and his position that he held with their father, they would do anything necessary to bring him down to their level or worse. Now, I want to pause here and say, 
Isn't that what jealousy does when it infects the heart? The desire to belittle another. The desire to have what another has. The idea of bringing them down in order to elevate oneself. Isn't that what jealousy does? These brothers, as did the men before Stephen as he preached, willfully stood against God's plan. How did they handle this with Joseph? Well, the scripture says they sold him into slavery. But if you know the story well, you know that Joseph was cast into a cistern when he first arrived where his brothers were keeping the flocks. They were going to decide what they were going to do with him. And here comes a band of slave traders. And they decide not to kill Joseph, but to sell him. To sell him to those slave traders. They sell him, but they keep his coat. And with that coat, they kill a lamb and they put blood on the coat and they take it back to their father. You see, their idea was... They were going to get rid of Joseph until daddy died. Now, I don't have any brothers and sisters. You may. And there may, be a time, there may have been a time in your life when you had a little run in with your brother or sister and you wanted to kill him until daddy died. That's the spirit that you see here. Only worse. These men sell Joseph and tell their father, that he has died. They're so opposed to God's plan. But wait. These men to whom Stephen preaches. Were those who followed the same idea. They wanted Jesus crucified. And they were willing to tell God he died. They wanted Jesus crucified. And he is. And they have the proof that he died. Because they have the blood that he shed when he was on the cross. But guess what? When they meet Joseph later, they know he is alive. Even though they'd shown father the blood on the coat... They have to admit to the father their trickery, their treachery, and they have to admit that his son is alive. Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. For he died upon the cross and he rose again to live. Joseph, a type of Jesus. These men opposed Jesus, the Messiah. Why? Because he had something they didn't. He had a following that they didn't have. He had a life that they didn't have. And here are these men who opposed Jesus, the Messiah, because he was a, going to bring a massive transformation in the money-making and power placement of their religious system. They oppose the church, the body of Christ, which is the new form of worship and the new message of salvation and the new understanding of God's kingdom. The result of the action of the patriarchs was that God exalted Joseph in Egypt and not Palestine. The result of the action of this court, when they hear Stephen's sermon and yet put him to death, the result of this court's action is to open the door for the gospel to be preached in Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. Because the scripture will tell us when we get to the end of Acts cha chapter 7 and the beginning of Acts chapter 8, that because of persecution, the church scattered and went into Samaria. What did Jesus tell his disciples? To preach in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. They rejected Joseph, just as these men were, had rejected Jesus. But guess what? There was a rescue. 
Hear the word that is given to us at the end of verse 9 and the beginning of verse 10. For God was with him and rescued him from all his afflictions and granted him favor. Joseph rescues his family even though they don't recognize him. Interesting, isn't it? Joseph had a hard road to travel, according to verse 9. The afflictions that he went through. The brothers first threatened death when they threw him into the empty cistern. However, he lived. Like Jesus, you could say of Joseph, his time had not yet come. Remember, there were times when they tried to take Jesus' life, about six of them, and Jesus said, my time has not yet come. And so it was for Joseph. His time had not yet come, and God was going to protect him. In fact, there are going to be several instances in his life you can read of in Genesis chapters 39 through 50. We're going to find that Joseph is sold into slavery, and due to false accusations made by his first owner's wife, he's imprisoned. But because he's imprisoned, he runs on to the cupbearer of the pharaoh. And he interprets a dream for the cupbearer. And he asks the cupbearer, remember me when you come to Pharaoh. And a year later, he remembered him. I wonder what his wife, the cupbearer's wife, thought about all the chores that she gave to her husband, how soon they got done. A year later, he remembers. And in that year later, as he remembers, he tells Pharaoh about Joseph. But I want us to think about this. Joseph is a slave. Joseph, Joseph is imprisoned. But during those times of trial, God was with him, which basically means that God provided opportunities to Joseph for him to develop his skills needed to do the work that was his to do and later confront him. In God's time, Joseph was gifted with interpreting dreams, the management of, and skills and other abilities that were needed when he would be released from prison and he would become second only to Pharaoh. He was governor over Egypt and all of Pharaoh's household. God was with Joseph in every pleasant and scary moment. God gave Joseph favor with others. His owner, Potiphar. Think about this. Potiphar has made him the steward or the manager of his whole household. And suddenly Potiphar's wife accuses Joseph of attempted rape. According to the law, he should have been killed. He should have been executed for what he had done. But he's put in prison. What was the favor of Potiphar? We want to say it was because he made him the head of his household. I believe the favor of Potiphar to him was he didn't have his life taken and had him put into prison. Joseph's in prison. He's made eventually the manager over the prison, second only to the jailer. He interprets the dream of the cupbearer who remembered on that day when, Potiphar, uh, when Pharaoh was ready to kill all of his diviners and magicians because they can't interpret his dream. The cupbearer says, I know a man, I know a Hebrew youth who can interpret this. They bring Joseph and Joseph interprets the dream and finds favor with Pharaoh. Let me tell you, God worked in unusual ways and in unusual places to gift Joseph with the wisdom and the skills that he needed to do his work. By the way, there's a good lesson in there for us. The good lesson for us is this. We will find God with us in every circumstance of our life, whether it's good or bad. Whether it's easy or difficult. God will be with us. And in, even in those times of difficulty, God is training us for what we can do in his service. Even in the most difficult times.
there was a severe famine that came upon the land. According to verses 11 and 12, Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt. So he sent his sons who could not find food in Canaan into Egypt. The first time they go into Egypt, the brothers encounter Joseph, but Joseph doesn't identify himself. Genesis chapter 42. The second time, Genesis chapter 45, Joseph identifies himself to his brothers. And Jacob and his family are rescued. I want you to think about that moment for just oh, that moment. Think about that moment when Joseph first sees his brothers in the first instance, but doesn't identify himself. When Jesus walked among the Jewish people on earth, he didn't identify himself until later in his ministry. When Joseph identifies himself to his brothers, it is out of compassion, it is out of forgiveness, it is out of love, it is out of an all-consuming grace that he embraces his brothers and sins for his father. You stop to realize what Jesus did when he, when we were at enmity with God, he sent his only son to save us. Have you thought about the embrace of the compassion and the love and the mercy that is found in the person of Jesus Christ in that instance? Does Joseph speak to us of Jesus? Oh, yes, he does. Joseph brought Jacob and the family down into Egypt, introduced them to Pharaoh, and they were given the best land possible. They were given the wetlands, the grasslands of Goshen where the Nile River begins to fork out going into the sea. They inhabit that land. But as years passed, there arose a Pharaoh who knew not Joseph. And they were made slaves. Egypt had already had a problem with a bunch of herdsmen in that area before. And so they just simply made slaves out of this group of herdsmen that now lived there because they didn't know Joseph and didn't know the story. Always helps to read your history. They didn't know the story. And they enslaved the people of God. What did God tell Abraham? Your people will be enslaved. What happened to them? They were enslaved. How did all of this come about, both the good and the bad and the ugly? It all came about because God's plan was fulfilled. Let me say to you this morning that God's plan is always implemented no matter how man tries to thwart it. The greatest efforts that can be made to stop God's plan cannot work. Joseph was God's chosen man. God was with him. He was chosen for a direct plan. And even though affliction and hunger and famine were in that plan, Joseph overcame and was delivered and was exalted. His brother's jealousy did not stop God's plan. Just like the jealousy of Jesus did not stop God's plan. How do we know that Israel was jealous of Jesus? Pilate, the Roman governor, said in Mark chapter 15, verse 10, for Pilate was aware that the chief priests had handed him over because of envy, because of jealousy. He had been handed over. Joseph is a type of Christ. Stephen understood that the very core of Joseph's life reflected the work of God, which Joseph started in Genesis 50, 20. Remember, Stephen is a Hellenistic Jew. So he spoke Greek and he read the Greek Septuagint, the Greek Old Testament, the Hebrew that was translated into Greek. And in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, Joseph had said, you took counsel against me for evil. But God took counsel on my behalf for good. 
God working in human history, especially in moments like these, point us to the resurrected Christ. Here's one sold into slavery, forgotten as though dead, blood evidence presented that he had died. And just like Jesus' death on the cross, there is good that comes forth from it. The family of Jacob goes down to Egypt. They find him alive, providing for them beyond any possible expectation. Here's a type of Jesus, our Lord, and the salvation he brings to us in resurrection. Joseph provided for them, providing for them, can only be seen as a grace gift. So we see in Jesus our grace gift. So we sing in Jesus every need he is supplying, plenteous grace he bestows. This is our walk with the Lord. This is our gift from the Lord. The family of Jacob was moved to a bountiful land, yet here's the beauty of this. When the patriarchs were moved into this promised land as they began to die, Jacob died. I want to be buried back home. I want to be buried back at Shechem. I want to be buried with dad, Abraham. He would go that far back. I want to be buried with Abraham. And he was. They took him in big procession. Even Egyptian guards went with them to protect them. A huge parade of people go to bury Jacob. Later, we find that as each one of the patriarchs dies, they're taken back and buried in the promised land. Joseph, when he dies, says to his sons and the descendants of Abraham, when you go to the promised land, take my bones with you and bury me there. And they do. Read Joshua. They do. You see, these patriarchs saw beyond a land of promise. They saw beyond this life. Just like Abraham died satisfied when he breathed out his last, knowing that God's promise was secure because he'd received grace and by faith believed. So Jacob knew that he had received grace and he had believed. So Joseph knew that he had received grace huh, and a bunch of it, and he believed. You see, they weren't looking at a promised land in this world. They were looking at a life that was yet to come. A promise and a hope that is beyond anything that can be expected. Remember what Jesus said? It was the night before his crucifixion. In John chapter 14, Jesus said to his disciples, For I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Jesus looked beyond this life. He looked to that life that is yet to come. He would prepare a place for his disciples. Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. Joseph saw and knew that God was with him and that God's grace was upon him. And when he died, he didn't want to be buried in Egypt, the world. He wanted to be buried in the promised land. He wanted that hope that was secure and eternal.
for all Joseph endured. Think with me about what Jesus endured. Jesus was perfect, but the world wasn't. And the times that he lived in weren't. And Jesus, as he led his disciples, by the way, 12, the same number as the patriarchs, as he led his disciples to faith and to hope and to future, he said to them at the last, there's a land of promise. There's a place to which I go. And if I'm going to go there, I'm going to prepare a place for you. There will be a place for you, not a plot, but a place. There will be plenteous room, just like the promised land promised to Abraham. There will be hope and future. Joseph tells us a lot about Jesus because Joseph endured and lived through the difficult days because he knew God by grace alone, through faith alone. He knew the living God. I don't know where your life is this morning. I don't know what you've had to endure or walk through. But I know this one thing, that in Jesus Christ, there is the assurance that when we come by grace, through faith, to know him as Savior, he is with us always. His Holy Spirit walks with us no matter what we go through. Do you feel like you're enslaved to your job or to a place or to responsibilities, our Lord is there with you. Do you feel like you're imprisoned, limited, locked in, can't go any further? God's with you. Guess what he'll do? You may be in a small, limited environment. But God is working in your life to make that the most pleasant place you could hope for. You wouldn't want anything other than that if God is with you. He's preparing you for that greater thing that you may do. And one day, when the opportunity comes, you can share life with others. You can care in the lives of others. And when the day comes... They may take your bones to a plot of land. But that spirit within you, that soul within you, is not limited any longer by this body. But we've gone to that place that our Lord has prepared for us. Today I invite you to one, know Jesus Christ as Savior. To second, for those of you who do know Christ, commit your circumstances to him. Commit your circumstances to him. Let him be with you in your circumstances. Know he is with you in those circumstances. And walk in the victory that he gives in the midst of those circumstances. Even when it looks like defeat, know that he has a place prepared for you. A life of praise. And worship and joy in the presence of the Father. This morning we sing, and as we sing, I invite you to respond to the call of the Lord upon your life. I invite you to respond to salvation, to respond to commitment of life to Christ, to respond in prayer where you are here at the, our prayer benches. I invite you to respond to the call of our Lord upon your life. If you need to recommit your life, you've, you've been in prison long enough, but you haven't really given that over to the Lord, I invite you to commit that time to him now. While we stand together and while we sing, let us respond to the Lord.
Trust Him, to hear Him by faith and believe, He will save you. He will save you now. We may have to endure until that day of salvation, fully found in the glorification in His presence. But guess what? We get to endure. And we get to see Him work in our life as we endure. And we get to share with others how he's been with us and how he is our Savior. And we can invite them to hear by faith that God will be present with them as they go through life. I don't know about you, but I get excited about these things. Historical retrospective sermons are difficult to preach. Because you've got to transition out of it. It's like watching these movies that flash back to something that happened a long time ago. Well, is that back then? Is that, that, that here? Where, where is this? Sometimes those sermons get that way. But I pray the Holy Spirit has kept you, <laughs> has, has kept you in line even though I didn't. So that you can see where God is and what he's doing. May God bless you this morning for being here. Let's bow together as we pray. Father, we are your people walking in your promise, thankful for your love for us and your call to us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. May we be faithful as Joseph was a type of Christ. So, Father, may we reflect the light of Christ in our life that men may see him and know and believe. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.